You're listening to Muslimish Freethinkers, a podcast dedicated to fostering conversations on matters of faith and disbelief. Welcome to Muslimish. If I find paper and pen in your cell, it's more dangerous than if I find a gun. That is what her jailer told her when she was jailed in September 1981. For the next two months of her imprisonment, Nawal Sadawi wrote Mudakkarat fi Sijn al-Nisa in 1984. Memoirs from the Women's Prison on a roll of toilet paper using a smuggled cosmetic pencil. Nawal Saadawi was born on October 27, 1931 and passed away last Sunday on the Eastern Mother's Day, March 21, 2021. She was an Egyptian secularist, feminist, humanitarian, author, activist, physician, and psychiatrist. She wrote many books on the subject of liberation of women, paying particular attention to the practice of female and male circumcision. She was against fundamental religions. She is considered to have been an apostate by many Muslims. She was described as the Simone de Beauvoir of the Arab world and as Egypt's most radical secularist feminist woman. El Saadawi was educated at Cairo University, Columbia University in New York, and Ayn Shams University in Cairo, where she performed psychiatric research in 1972 to 1974. In 1955 to 1965, she worked as a physician at Cairo University and in the Egyptian Ministry of Health. And in 1966, she became the Director General of the Health Education Department within the ministry. In 1968, she founded Health Magazine, which was shut down by Egyptian authorities several years later. And in 1972, she was expelled from her professional position in the Ministry of Health because of her book, Al Mar'a Wal Jins, 1969, Women and Sex, which was condemned by religious and political authorities. In 1982, Al Sadawi founded the Arab Women Solidarity Association and later saved, uh, served as an editor of the organization's publication, Al Noon. In 1991, the government closed down Al Noon, and then several months later, AWSA itself. Due to her outspoken views, Al Saadawi continued to face frequent legal challenges from political and religious opponents, including accusations of apostasy. In 2002, a legal attempt was made by an Islamic lawyer to forcibly divorce her from her husband, and in May 2008, she won a case that had been brought against her by Al Azhar University, the major center for Islamic learning, that included charges of apostasy and heresy. The Sadawi was not only an Egyptian feminist and human rights activist, she was an international feminist and human rights activist. She believed that both male and female children deserve protection from genital mutilation, circumcision. She was also critical about the objectification of women and female bodies in patriarchal social societies, neither by religious veil, religious headscarf, and religious clothes of women, nor selling by naked women. In 2002 lecture at the University of California, Saadawi described the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan as a war to exploit the oil in the region and U.S. foreign policy and its support of Israel as real terrorism. Saadawi held the opinion that Egyptians are forced into poverty by U.S. aid. She believed that colonialism of Egypt was inherited by the United States from Britain. She was founder and president of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association and co-founder of the Arab Association for Human Rights. She was awarded honorary degrees on three continents, multiple honorary doctorates, and named one of the top women of the year in 1981 by Time, and again in 2015 by the BBC.
In 2004, she won the North-South Prize from the Council of Europe. In 2005, she won the Inanna International Prize in Belgium. And in 2012, the International Peace Bureau awarded her the 2012 Sean McBride Peace Prize. After traveling all over the world, I discovered that girls are brought up in a very similar way. We are all in the same boat. The patriarchal religious capitalist system is universal. I have had a dream since I was a child. A very mad dream, but very simple. To change the world. The dream is still alive. This is what Nawal Sadawi said in an interview in 2018. Muslimish strives to create a safe, supportive, and open-minded environment for the exchange of thoughts and ideas among Muslims with various degrees of religiosity. To foster a pluralistic society that respects the rights of all individuals to live according to their conscience, and to abolish blasphemy and apostasy laws across the globe. So it is natural for Muslimish to consider Nawal Sadawi as one of the heroes of freedom of speech. I would like to present to you the main speakers of today who will each have a few minutes to present their commentary on Nawal Sadawi. Then we will open the discussion with a few more guests, guests and uh, with you through the comments. We encourage you to leave your comments in the comment section during uh, the show. First, I will have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jinan Raouf. She's a writer who uses oral history uh, methodology in her work, a fine art photography activist, and a co-founder of a humanist organization, NAS, that focuses on fostering humanism in communities of Muslim background. She is devoted mother of two boys. Welcome, Jinan, to uh, this broadcast, and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here with this wonderful um, panel. Um, and to speak about someone as inspiring as Noel Sadewi, I am going to be talking a little bit about how much Noel Sadewi inspires me as a secular humanist who comes from a Muslim background. And I think for us as humanists, we're here on earth for a very short period of time. And so one of the values that informs our lives as humanists is that we are here to experience life intensely and to enjoy it and to learn and to develop our potential. So when I think about the complexity of a character like Nawel Issa-Dewi, who identifies herself first as a human being and as a woman and as a writer and a dissident and a rebel and an organizer and a socialist and a physician, and a psychiatrist, and as somebody who was exiled from her country but went back and took part in the revolution, this is someone who, ins who is an incredibly interesting role model for me because this is a woman who lived her life intensely and developed her faculties and her potential. So for, huma for a humanist, you can't box her in. You can't say she's one thing or the other. And as tragic as all the discussions that are going on about is she, um, in the wider society, like, is she an apostate? Is she a Muslim? Is she going to hell? Is she that? That, that really misses the point and the complexity of a character like Noel Sadewi because it's really hard to pin her down. She's a dynamic woman who's constantly changing and growing. And I think that that really frustrates people. And it brings out a lot of the insecurities that people have of wanting to know, well, what was she? Was she a Muslim? Was she an apostate? And so forth. And I think that's what makes her, from my perspective as a humanist, such an interesting and inspiring character, is that there is this fluidity and there is this ability to see what can be done with life? And so in that, that's one way that I think we can approach her work. So I, I would like to just touch a little bit upon her work to demonstrate that. So um, she was, um, so this complexity of her character, I think also is reflected in the very wide range of writing styles that she incorporates. I mean, this is a woman who writes, you know, straight books about you know, the theoretical books, but she also writes plays, she writes autobiographies, she writes memoirs, she writes prison memoirs. And I think it is that 
it is really, I think we need to be very attentive to how her very complex, the, the complex dimensions of her being are given expression in different mediums. And I think she was experimenting a lot with different kinds of writing because she had a very irrepressible urge to um, express herself. And so that is, I think is something that one can look at as one is looking at the different kinds of writings that she does. But for me also as a secular humanist, I am very intrigued by her representation of her grandmother. Because her grandmother, she takes pains. And I don't know if this is like a literal, realistic representation of her mother or whether it is a trope, whether she's creating for herself an ancestor, a female ancestor through whom she can think back. You know, we have feminist writers like Virginia Woolf who said we need to think back through the grandmothers. So it's very interesting the um the the representation of the grandmother in her work and in so many of her interviews she goes to great lengths and pain to say my grandmother was a peasant she was an illiterate woman she did not have much education but she was a rebel and she was a revolutionary and she would take on the religious figures in the village and for her, God was all about justice. And so I think she becomes for her this, this ancestor who is female, who is rebellious in a society where we assume that women, particularly women from who are not literate or women who live, you know, who come from traditional families and who live in the village, we assume that they are going to be passive. And we also assume that they are going to be, and this is really important, that they are going to be passive consumers of knowledge that's constructed by male structures. And then the women are going to imbibe that automatically. So I think it's a very clever move because what she's saying is you don't have to go to Oxford. You don't have to be a westernized elite to have this innate human sense of justice and of not submitting to male authority. Now for me as a humanist who does not believe in the divine origin of knowledge, that's a big deal. It means that we are seeing women who are constructing and creating knowledge from their lived experiences. And if we go on and we look a little bit more, when she's asked very often in interviews, so are you like your grandmother? Are you a rebel by nature? Are you a rebel? She says specifically, it's partly genetic and it's partly acquired. In other words, what she's really saying is this idea that women are obedient or that this is part of our, in, in Islamic terms, our fitra or our nature to be passive and to be obedient, whether we're talking about obedience to a father figure in the home, to a male teacher in the school, to a prophet maybe, or to a God, that this is all of this is being called into question. And she is affirming that, and she's locating it within her family tree going back, to, but also in a specific locale. So here she's making another, in my view, really interesting move is that this is a non-Western form of feminism. This is not the feminism that we are passively, um, importing from the West. And she says something that's really interesting. She says, you know, we practice feminism before we have a word for it. And that's a really interesting thing because the West seems to think that they have to label things in order for things to be recognizable and therefore we can see it. So she goes on and she talks about her own development as a writer. And one of the things that she, um, she, emphasizes, I think, a lot, is that it is from her experiences as a child that she begins to awaken to the fact that she is a feminist. So, and I so identify with that. So the locus of where she actually begins to have a sense that she's a girl is in the home in relationship to her brother. So she has a brother who's a year older than her who's spoiled, 
who doesn't do any work, who doesn't study, who's not doing as well as she is doing academically, and yet he's rewarded. Whereas she is very successful academically, she helps her mother around the house, and then she notices that he gets rewarded because he's a male by having freedom. So she sees freedom as a reward. And so her reaction to that situation is she learns about injustice at home. She uses a child's language. It's unfair. But, and so again, as a humanist for me, the idea that you have to have a revealed religion in order to know right from wrong or in order to know what justice is, no, this is innate. This child learns from her lived experience. And that gives her the courage. And her writing, by the way, is very, very personal. And so she fights back. And then the other incident that she talks about is when she is at school and they and the teacher asks her to write her name. So she writes her name. She writes Noel Zainab Saadawi. And the teacher looks at her and she says, no, no, no. Cross out Zainab because that's her mother's name and write your father and your grandfather's name. And she gets, she says this is a moment when she's like an epiphany for her. And I find that very interesting. And she says, there's two reasons why I wanted to have my mother's name. A, my mother gave birth to me. And B, my mother was the one who taught me the alphabet. She was the one who taught me. And that's a very interesting move as well. Because what she is insisting upon here is that a woman is both a biological being, but that she's also a cognitive intellectual being. Now, we know in Western tradition, culture is often associated with the male and nature is with the female. Now, Eli Sadawi is really appropriating that and saying that the logos or the word or language or the transmission of knowledge can go through the woman. And it is her mother who teaches her how to Right. So that's a really important thing. And so I think by implication, what she is challenging in the school is that the official educational institutions are not going to erase the knowledge that comes from the home and is not going to erase her personal experience. It's just kind of she's giving it a name. She's giving kind of worth to the to the mother, but also to the kind of experiences that she will eventually have as a writer who's writing about her own experience. She's kind of giving it a kind of legitimacy. Maybe maybe what I'm driving is that is that she's creating a kind of literary genealogy for herself, which I find really, really um, interesting. And then it's very interesting. Then the third thing is she then begins to question. So we go from the I refuse to be erased to rebelling and questioning. And when she's at when she asks her parents, why can't I go out? The question that she gets is because, because God said so. Because God let's the boys go out. And she began to realize that God interferes in everything. And this is really interesting. So she says, she writes a letter to God. So again, you, as you see, her writing is always comes out organically from a particular cultural context that she is in. And she is angry at God. She's angry at God. Now, for people who are fundamentalists, this can seem like apostasy. But we have Job in the Old Testament. You know, this, this, there is this tradition of writing where you are debating with God. And so what I would argue here is that you have indigenous traditions. I mean, I think in, in be, one year after um, Bertrand Russell wrote Why I'm Not a Christian, there was an Egyptian writer who, I don't remember his name right now, he wrote Why I'm, a, I'm an Atheist and was not killed and was not so forth. So, so for me as, as a humanist, so here is someone who is struggling and for her, she is talking with God and she's saying, if you are going to be unfair to me, if you are going to be cruel to me by giving my brother who's far less talented freedoms that I don't have, then I will not worship you. So this idea then of 
questioning becomes an integral part of her work and her life, both as an intellectual and I would argue as an activist, that she is going to, so we go from, you know, establishing this kind of genealogy of women literary predecessors, I think to critical thinking. And for me, again, as somebody who's a humanist, critical thinking is of the essence. And what she's doing meanwhile is I think she's cultivating virtues that appeal to us as humanists because it's, so one of the virtues that she's cultivating here is courage, is the courage to speak back, to talk back, to insist that her experiences are valid and not to submit. So she is de facto um, undoing a lot of the virtues that have traditionally or historically been associated with traditional gender roles and that are often pushed upon women who are pious. So she is elevating virtues such as rebellion and anger. And this is where I find she really anticipates a lot of what's happening now in the feminist world. You, we've had a series of books now about the importance that of anger for women, that we have to be angry. So this anger that she felt towards her brother, towards the boys who would harass her on the street because she dared go out on the street and they were trying to put her in her place. But this anger is now being reclaimed by feminists, for example, like the firebrand feminist, Mona Tahawi, who's saying, we have to reclaim that anger because that anger is what allows us to say no what gives us courage and what enables us in the as we organize to change the world that is enraging us. So I think in many ways she was both an intersectional feminist and somebody who recognized the incredible importance of anger that we suppress in women in ways that are used, I think, to to make us more submissive. And she understood that before it was really, I think, as widely as understood as it is now. Um, and I was just reading a really interesting article by a young feminist, maybe she looked like she was in her 20s in Egypt, who was so angry about the um, spate of sexual harassment and rapes that are now going on in the country. And she said, I never knew it until I watched an interview with Noelle Sadawi, and she talked about the importance of anger and I understood. And so I think her influence is not only in what she says or her ideas, but how she liberates women emotionally in the body to express and to feel that rage and that anger. And I think that's a really important thing And it, it, because she's a very holistic writer. Her emotions are not split off from her intellect. And then she goes on and she says, as I graduated, as I went to college, I began to realize that my anger, I had to do something with it. And she wanted to change the world because it, it's not enough. And that's where I think in the West, people often, um, she's often represented and the receptive space in, this, in the West is that she is this iconic feminist who's just so extraordinary and so different. But she talks a lot about the importance of organizing and of solidarity with other women and men in order to change structures. And I think that that's another one of her, um, one of her, um, really important roles it, and that is in a, and, and she's very very clear about the fact that she does not want to be confused with a white liberal feminist where it's all about careerism and the individual becoming successful she's talking about human solidarity and the capacity for people to work together in order to change structures and i think that in this historical moment that we are in, she is extremely relevant for people who come from communities of color like us, who are in a situation in the US where we are fighting for religious freedom or freedom from religion, but we are also engaged at the same time. And I, in, um, in struggles against injustice, whether we're talking about imperialism or, um, racism or white supremacy or economic suppression because she was a socialist. And so so in the West, they always like to talk about Noelle Sadewi or predominantly 
as somebody who fought female genital mutilation, which she did, and which is extremely important. But what I am saying is that it's important that we don't just reduce her to that, because the breadth of her commitment is really, really um, much larger. And I think I'll stop, because I could go on, because I really admire her. So I think I will... I'll stop yeah, no, thank you, Jinan. I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't have stopped you because it was a, a beautiful flow of uh, uh, narrative about El Saadawi and this, uh, you ended it with a very important point that uh, uh, many try to, re you know, uh, reduce her to the person who fought uh, female genital mutilation, but she is uh, way larger uh, than that. And if she was given more platform, she would have even tackled more subjects. But uh, we are very glad that she has focused on this important subject. Thank you, Jinan. We'll, we'll come back to you with the, the, the dialogue section. I'd like to introduce you now to uh, our uh, next speaker, uh, Barbara Nimri Aziz. She's a, a New York-based uh, anthropologist, journalist, and author as a founder and director of Rawi, Radius of Arab American Writers Incorporation, up to 2005. She promoted a literary community in its early stages. This was related to her radio journalism as producer and host of www.radiotahrir.org from 1989 to 2013. Uh, Nawal Sadawi was among the outstanding and emerging literally and political personalities who appeared on her program. Uh, you can learn more about Aziz's work, um, Barbara's work, including her books and blog at barbaranimri.com. And congratulations, uh, Barbara, on your uh, new uh, recent publication. Uh, the floor is yours. Just unmute yourself, unmute. Bob. Okay. Again, thanks very much, Wasim, and thank you uh, to Muslimish for inviting me today to join this. I feel a bit of an interloper here because after Janan's eloquent analyses, uh, from which I myself began to reflect more about Nawal al Sadawi. Um, I, I haven't read her work for many years. Uh, what I can contribute is more anecdotal uh, because I met Nawal al Zadawi on many occasions going back to 1990. And you mentioned Rawi, the uh, Arab uh, American Writers Organization. Through that, I pursued. Uh, Arab writers, <laughs> whether they were in the United States or in uh, the Arab lands. And she was one of those people I was keen to meet and to draw into Rawi, but also to interview because I began my, um, my dialogue, I guess you could call it, uh, with Nawal al Sadawi uh, through my interviews on. Uh, WBAI on Radio Tahrir. And uh, I just want to uh, add a few anecdotes. I remember her saying how important her medical work was. You mentioned in the introduction uh, her work in the ministries, but before that, of course, she was a physician. And I remember her saying to me how she moved through the villages. Uh, and there learned a great deal about conditions, especially of women, which helped her formulate uh, some of her uh, early feminist thinking. Uh, Janan just talked about how her own family and her, her relations with her brother and her parents also um, provided the kind of seed of feminism. And then later on, uh, then she had the practical experience with other women and through medicine also uh, understood their lives much better. Uh, also, uh, I want to mention that uh, I knew both Nawal and her husband, Sharif Hatata, who was a novelist. And he was, I remember, uh, a an employee or a an official with the ILO, the International Labor Organization, and he was very much a Marxist. 
and a political theorist. And Nawal, I remember saying how she, it was through his influence on her as a Marxist that expanded her perspective again uh, and her uh, pursuit in, in understanding more clearly uh, capitalism and patriarchy. And they worked very, very well as a team uh, in that respect. And in a way, she, she uh, brought his teaching, uh, his political teaching, to a much, uh, I, I would say, much more advanced level. By advanced, I mean through her writing and her speaking. Uh, his his uh, speaking, when I heard him on a couple of occasions, was much quieter. And he was just a very different character, and uh, his his writing was perhaps more penetrating. But in her speaking, she was able, as all of you know, to fuse uh, her understanding of capitalism and patriarchy and international colonialism, of course, uh, in a very, very rich way. He also was her translator on many of her, especially her early books. Uh, his English was very, very fluent, of course, hers is as well, but as Janan, I think, mentioned, Nawal uh, preferred to write in Arabic. Um, I want to also uh, recall an incident early on, uh, which I remembered just yesterday when I was going through some of my uh, materials uh, about her. I rem remember the occasion where, you know, when no Noel came to New York, uh, she was very much uh, a celebrity for a very small group of people in the 90s. It was not <laughs> a large group. Uh, she was quite unpopular uh, with a certain Arabic middle class community who were very embarrassed about uh, uh, circumcision issues being s uh, made so public. And also, um, uh, they didn't understand uh, her either. They probably hadn't read her work, but she was very flamboyant. You could say almost flamboyant. Um, certainly uh, very articulate and very uh, bold. Maybe bold is better than flamboyant. Uh, and uh, so there was a lot of criticism of her. You know, we as Arabs here needed um, a hero or a heroine. We needed uh, an international figure. And uh, she was not easily digested by many of the established Arab community here. In any case, um, uh, I was asked and I was thrilled to accompany her uh, on an NPR interview. That was a radio interview. We were She was visiting New York. So I went with her to the NPR studio and uh, sat uh, throughout that. But the opening question uh, of the this uh, very well-known, although I don't recall her name, may have been Koki Roberts or, you know, a leading uh, NPR host started the interview by asking Nawal. It sounds quite incredible today when, <laughs> when you... Uh, hear this, but uh, she said to Nawal, uh, I mean, the opening statement, can you imagine? <laughs> Are you a good Muslim? And Nawal was just, her reply was brilliant. I mean, she didn't, she, she didn't, didn't phase her at all. And her reply was, that is between God and me. And to me, and I think to many others, that is symptomatic. That is a that is a real Nawal reply because she uh, had to deal as she emerged as a spokesperson uh, of Islam in a way. You know, we're going back to the '90s, and uh, very little was written. General, generally, very little was written that was. I mean, that was before this famous uh, what's her name Anderson. Um, who, who writes about Islam, all these uh, Western writers who began interpreting Islam in the late 90s. 
uh, in the early 90s, there was very little one could go to uh, that was simplistic enough. And so Nawal became a kind of target, in a way, of people questioning Islam. And I think that question that was put to her in that interview is an example of that. And she could handle these, uh, this, these naiveties uh, beautifully, really. And then, of course, um, the, 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 the Muslim woman, but the Arab woman also was something, if not exotic, at least um, something um, not very positive. Again, we're, we're talking about the early 90s when we didn't have so many celebrities and we didn't have the films, the acknowledgement of uh, our achievements and, and our lives. We didn't have uh, so many novels and, and uh, other writings by Arab women in English and very few translated. So again, she became in a way the spokesperson for our culture, our religion, our woman, uh, identity. And she handled that very well. And I'm sure over the years, she grew more and more uh, better equipped to handle um, the, the, the very naive public. And then um, uh, you find her very exciting um, um, talks. I mean, now you're seeing uh, after her passing, you're seeing clips uh, from interviews and you see how sharp he, she is. And as uh, Janan uh, Rauf was just saying, you know, she was very, um, she was able to combine and fuse and, and enrich uh, issues uh, in a way that very few people can. Very few people can. And you, you notice in her interviews, no bitterness, no bitterness at all. Very kind to a lot of very rude people. And, um, you know, I was sorry at the time that so many of our established um, Muslim community, Arab community here, again, we're talking, I'm talking about another generation. I'm not talking about young feminists. By young, I mean people under 40. <laughs> And, um, you know, they were not ready for her. They couldn't handle her and they were not receptive to her. And, and so I myself felt badly that we couldn't entertain her and not just entertain her, uh, but to host her in the forums uh, that she couldn't become a focus of our own need as a, an ethnic community, as a religious community. And so she was drawn more to white feminists. Let me just use that term generally, let's say American white feminists who did understand her, who were not, um, who were not laden with this Arabness and our own confusion about our own identity. And we, you know, being put on the spot to answer questions about our religion and our fathers and our brothers and, you know, our heritage, which um, uh, was confusing for many of us. And she was very clear. And uh, particularly just to sum up, um, I, I was, I, I'm an anthropologist and I um, had not a lot of feminist thinking and orientation uh, as an anthropologist. Again, I, you know, I finished my PhD in 1974, and the 70s were just the beginning of Western feminism and how Western feminism came to impact sociologists and anthropologists, all disciplines, of course. But I was less influenced by the writing of other um, early uh, scholars criticizing uh, anthropology. Uh, and and when I met Noal El Sadawi, I understood her in a way, uh, her her ability to analyze feminism and and patriarchy. And uh, to this day, I still am very um, um, upset how Western feminists, in fact, became became patriarchal towards us, towards. Uh, the global women, they assumed the role, even though they were 
uh, feeling liberated, Western feminists assumed this patriarchal role and uh, saw the rest of us as victims who they needed to liberate, who they needed to study. And Nawal would have none of that. And uh, watching her, reading her work, I was able myself to understand this trap that those of us of the other world uh, can become uh, uh, stuck in. And uh, in that respect, she was very, very important. I mean, the way she links white feminism or Western feminism with patriarchy is very profound and very sim simple. Thank She's you. a very simple thinker in so many ways. I'll finish there. Thank you, Barbara, very much for, for this uh, insightful uh, take and also uh, about giving your testimony to history about your personal encounter with, uh, with Noel Saadawi uh, in, the, in the early 80s and 90s. Um, the next speaker I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Zainab Asaf uh, from um, University of Wayne State. She's a local. Uh, here uh, in Detroit. Uh, I'm going to read the, the bio in Arabic. Zainab Asaf, Shaara wa Katiba Lubnaniya Taish fi America. Ustada fi Qism al Lugal Ferencia fi Jama at Wednesday, Sadarelaha fi Shaar Salat al Ghaib, Bawab al Zakir al Fad, Farasha Mayita Bada at Ba Kitab Aleha, Fin Nether, Rayabak Samet, Wal Amir, Kamiyah and Khatira, of the Terjama and the Ferencia. إقليدي سيات لأوجين جيوفيك وفي الرواية تصدر قريبا عودة إيما شاركت في تأسيس وتحرير مجلة نقد وجريدة ودار الغاوون للشعر عملت كمديرة للقسم الثقافي في جريدة أوان ومحررة ثقافية في جريدة النهار اللبنانية uh, Welcome زينب Zainab, she got disconnected for a second. We'll come back to her once she's back. Uh, we have with us also Wafa, Wafa uh, uh, Bahri. Oh, Zainab is back. We'll come back to Wafa. Zainab, are you with us? Great, good to see you. Your sound and picture. Yes, can you hear me? I'm really but I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I don't. Know. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for this because I'm uh, no on my it's phone getting... and I have some. Uh... Okay. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, I don't know what to say after uh, what Dr. Nimri Aziz and Dr. Rolf said. Uh, I think they covered all the aspects of um, the and gave her, um, you know, a complete ability. But uh, what I wanted to say is maybe I can apport something from another perspective, which is like a, a following generation. So uh, I wanted to relate to this point, which is like um, Nawal al-Sadawi is not an uh, occidental feminist, not because she is like this genuine uh, feminist uh, Arabic feminist, but because she is coming from a generation of feminism in the Arabic world, because feminism didn't really start um, in the Occidental world. Because if we if we go a little bit to history and uh, see, for example, that the Syrian Hind Naufal, uh, who was born in 1860, published a feminist magazine in 1892, and that means even before. Uh, Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own. So, I mean, we are talking about like almost around the same time, like the, the, the Arabic feminism started the same time when Occidental feminism started. And I guess it's the whole, this is the situation in the whole world for a reason, because around this time, women started going to school. So, I mean, this idea that um, white Occidental women invented feminism uh, it's not very true it's only the matter of languages like maybe because there's no there's no enough translation of these early 
uh, Arabic feminist work. I wanted to mention a few uh, uh, works here. Like, for example, of course, we cannot talk about feminism and not mention Huda Sha'rawi, who is who was born in 1879 in Cairo and who fought for women rights for education in Egypt. Uh, we cannot also so like these two names. I took these two names, uh, which were the or, uh, the early um, Arab feminists, and also so this is one of them is in Syria. The other one is in Egypt. Also in Lebanon, like we cannot forget other names. For example, Labiba Hashim, who uh, published *The Girl of Orient* in 1906, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Afifa Karam, who became, uh, who she, she immigrated to New York, but she continued her um, activism. Uh, also, we cannot not talk about Maiz Yedi, for example, or like Salma Abi Rashid, who was the first lawyer. Uh, female lawyer in Lebanon. So what I wanted to say is like Arabic feminism really started around the same time when um, Occidental, I don't like this word, but this is, I don't find a better one. Uh, so when Occidental feminism started, so, so it's not something that we imported because we wanted, we want to destroy um, the religion or, you know, like this patriarchal uh, system that, that we have. It's something that just happened naturally everywhere in the world. But it, of course, it's very normal, too, that the narrative we have is the Occidental narrative, because until now, it's the English language, it's the, the whole, um, I wanted to say that the, the industry of knowledge is completely in the Occident still, but it doesn't mean that feminism didn't exist in the Arabic world uh, before Nawal al-Sadawi. And, and it will continue, of course, after Nawal al-Sadawi. Now, Nawal al-Sadawi was very, very important for one reason, which is like combining feminism with um uh, political activism. And in this meaning, I found her a little bit close to the Anglo-American meaning of feminism more than the French uh, feminism, for example, because we know like French feminists were very much, um, th they worked so much on a theoretical level, like kind of like having discussion with Marxism, with um, uh, like post, uh, with uh, uh, constructuralism and all the other uh, thinking schools. So Nawala Sadawi was kind of both of them. She had the theoretical, um, uh, I wanted to say part, and especially I think uh, Dr. Rolf talked about I think Dr. Aziz said uh, that um, it's also because of her husband too, like um, the influence of her husband. But she, so so she kind of had both of them. She had like the 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 political activism and the theoretical um, knowledge as a feminist, and that makes her a real icon, like someone who's very. Um, she, she she had it all, if we can say that. So and 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 I think that's why, like, she is still a figure which is a very um, not necessarily that everyone will accept her. And I think she knew her all her life, and she acted based on this. She she wouldn't even be surprised now that the level of discussion happening in the, the Arabic world is so mediocre to the point that people are saying, is she going to? Uh, to heaven or to hell. Like, I cannot really imagine that we're really having this discussion now. But um, I mean, she, she was she was completely a real person and she knew she knew that the influence that, that she would have, because like, for example, someone like me, um, how like the books of Nawal al-Sadawi were for me and for my generation and for a lot of other um, girls too, these are like uh, the founding books to see the world in a different way. Now, for me, it was a little different because I grew up in a house where we have a freedom, where we were very used to discuss. But um, I imagine for someone who never had another point of view, how important all, all these books are like to, 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 to to have to give a woman a tongue to talk in her native language 
and then to discuss things that we take for just we accept them the way they are so this is this is very very interesting the other point i wanted to talk about is uh feminism um uh, uh, and literature and why nawal sada we decided to write like she could just be a, uh, a doctor she's a physician and she was practicing and then someone would say like she would just continue practicing help women this way so why did she write and i think it's very organic for any feminist to write because we shouldn't forget that feminism unlike other uh, disciplines is a tightly uh, literary related uh, theory and the reason is because women when they started um, getting educated this that was their tools this is how they started this discussion with the society through literature and then and feminism is always very concerned about um about how how women were absent from literature for for centuries and centuries so it's very natural it's very normal that um she went uh for writing and then i wanted to talk about another thing which is like um uh, which is very interesting and i think nawal also had this in her personality she always talked about human liberation not only women liberation so that means in in some in some ways like she, she talks a lot about um um the imperialism and other things so she was struggling in in two battles uh, if i can say that like first she is with this society struggling inside this society uh to against all kind of injustice i will say common injustice as a group of arab people and the second fight was for um arab women which is like inside this society Society. And this is very interesting because it reminds me also of um, African American feminists. Um, I think uh, Teresa Guy talks about her, this in her book. Um, it's kind of like uh, uh, letters between her and uh, Maya Angelou, and she mentioned how during the civil rights movement, um, she said literally. Uh, so we, as African American women, we found ourselves struggling for the african-american man and then after that we have to go to another struggle which was for the american women so i think like it really speaks to the kind of situation um Nawal lived all her life and the kind of courage she endured in her life and even after her death when we see that the kind of conversation happening now in the arabic Word. But anyhow, I feel like not even in the Arabic word, even here among our community, I, we are all aware of this. Um, what I wanted to say is all of this is, is really healthy. Uh, Nawal will continue to be an icon and to inspire uh, a lot of uh, new coming generation. Uh, she is very authentic uh, to the Arabic and the Islamic culture. And I think if we don't get to the point in our Arabic world to accept someone like Nawal and to acknowledge her and to respect her and uh, to, to love her because she really spoke um, in behalf of those who couldn't talk, you know. So, I mean, if we don't get to this point, uh, I don't think we can really have any hope, you know, like we, 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 we have to get inside our Islamic and our, our Arabic culture to accept this level of discussion. Otherwise, I don't know where we are going because the kind of discussions we're having now reminds me like, you know, like even uh, during the seventh century, people were really much more advanced in their level of discussion about narrative, um, about native Arabic sciences, which is everything related to Quran and to the Arabic language. Um, so this is very, very interesting, like this point, which is like whenever someone, it's the same point also when we talk about the Arabic spring, which is like these people who have this 
occidental mentality and now they want to destroy the society and this is what extremists keep repeating and repeating and repeating like if we like whenever we we're always copying and this is really not very true i'm sorry continue with Zainab, please so okay. so so i was saying um so what, what i was saying is um like whenever it comes to talk about freedom to talk about women rights to talk about uh, human rights in general we are always we have always uh this uh sensitivity which is like yes but this is an occidental approach uh to to this topic and i think this is definitely not true especially in the case of nawal sadawi and um, of, in the case of um, Arabic feminism. Now, when I say Arabic feminism, also, I want to mention that we had a lot of men, uh, Arab feminists, like, for example, Qasim Amin, uh, who is a pioneer in this domain, uh, and he was born in 1863. So if we compare, so actually, the 60s is kind of the high water for feminism around the world, including um, the Arab world. And this is also the time when Nawal uh, was very active. So, so, so it, it was kind of like a, a general um, activity all around the world. It wasn't something that like, it, it wasn't that we decided to be influenced by uh, Occident or, or, or uh, you know, um, yes. So, so basically, this, this is what I wanted uh, to talk about. Um, I don't know if you want me to continue. Thank you very much, uh, Zainab. Really we actually, <laughs> yeah, I know that. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm glad that we heard you. I'm going to remove you for a second uh, just to clarify the, the sound. Uh, I'm glad, Zainab, we heard you very clearly. So because it was a very, very important uh, uh, insight and uh, introduction. I uh, really feel that these uh, need to be individual lectures. Uh, they're very, very important takes and points. Uh, and speaking uh, of which, on the level of conversations, we actually have Amr Zahar with us, who we're going to discuss some of his engagement with the community about this in a second. But before we bring Amr and uh, Wafa, she's been uh, waiting with us. And thank you, Wafa, for joining us. Uh, Wafa, uh, she's a Tunisian a Mazir, uh, uh, free thinker and advocate for individual liberties. Thank you, Wafa, for joining us. Uh, please uh, do participate. We want to hear you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and uh, uh, it's really uh, an honor for me to participate in this discussion about uh, an icon. Uh, uh, and that's Dr. Nawal uh, al Sadawi. Uh, I'd like to um, add um, a layer in my uh, introduction, uh, which you did very well, uh, Wissam. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, I am an ex-Muslim. So I identify myself as a Tamazigh uh, ex-Muslim woman uh, originally from Tunisia. And what I would like to talk about after the fantastic talks by uh, the three um, first speakers, uh, which uh, who uh, provided uh, a very um, deep and complex interpretations uh, to Dr. Uh, Saadawi's work. Uh, what, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, probably a more of a superficial and straightforward reading uh, to, of uh, uh, Nawal Saadawi's work. And I think that what uh, unites Dr. Uh, um, Saadawi's work is her uh, feminism uh, because um, uh, for her, feminism includes uh, everything, the social justice, the political justice, uh, the sexual justice. And uh, it becomes really hard to um, start a conversation or discussion about the oppression of women without having that background already set up and without having the framework uh, and that's uh, feminism so in uh, Nawal Sada, we worked or a discourse uh, um, about uh, fe fe uh, feminism. She uh, fought, as we all know and been mentioned, against uh, female uh, circumcision. Uh, and uh, I think her book, uh, which I read a long, long time ago, Women and Sex, uh, is where she uh, laid out uh, her opinion bluntly and uh, uh, bravely against this horrendous practice. Um, uh, 
also her fight against the idea of a woman's virginity as a guardian of virtue and honor uh, for men and particularly uh, during the wedding night and uh, the amount of humiliation and degradation that comes along um, this um, this idea and not only for men not only for women but uh, I mean I meant uh, also for men and, uh, and uh, this is another area of strength in uh, uh, Noel's uh, work her um, feminist discourse uh, it does not only is very inclusive uh, for both men and women and uh, uh, men in her discourse are not simply uh, allies uh, are not are not enemies uh, but also are not just allies for uh, um, for the feminist uh, discourse uh, they matter as much as women matter and they could be seemingly victimized by uh, the patriarchy um, and uh, then her fight against uh, the um, the child bride uh, Practice, which is uh, a cultural practice, uh, but also um, uh, it's reinforced by the religious and uh, teaching, and particularly in the uh, Arabic-speaking world or the Muslim-majority countries, it's referred by uh, Islam. And we all know the story of uh, of uh, um, Aisha, the youngest wife of uh, and how that uh, of the Pro of Muhammad, and how that affected the, uh, the narratives afterwards. And um, so. Um, uh, Noel's blame is all that obviously on on uh, uh, poverty, probably the question of uh, uh, class and uh, capitalism and the uh, uh, religious um, fundamentalism, uh, obviously. Um, uh, but one of the battles that uh, clung to my mind, and I find it really interesting, and I think uh, Gina spoke about it already, and that's uh, women giving their names to uh, their children. Um, I think um, uh, I found the struggle that, uh, uh, or the battle that her uh, daughter went through, and the ordeal that her daughter, Muna uh, Noel Helmi, uh, went through uh, because of this title, Muna Noel Helmi. Uh, um, um, I think uh, she signed a letter on the mother's Islam, Noel, uh, and using um, her name, Noel, and she ended up being in court because of this, uh, um, uh, because of, of, of doing so. Uh, so she was taken uh, to court for, for doing this, uh, but this incident was considered a kind of um, a hearsay or, or, or of a hearsay nature, and the probably formed uh, the base of several accusations of uh, blasphemy and apostasy against um, uh, Noel uh, as um, uh, Another battle where she uh, uh, found, um, I mean, I was um, influenced, where I, I am personally influenced by, and I found uh, inspiration, and that's the question of hijab, uh, hijab, I'm sorry, in the Muslim majority countries, and particularly the idea of hijab as a choice, uh, which is, um, and another narrative that Nawal Sadawi criticized vehemently. Uh, she's uh, probably among the pioneers, as I understand her work, who understood the effects of the indirect oppression um, that comes uh, along wearing hijab. Uh, so uh, women, uh, I mean, they, you may hear them talking about hijab as a free choice, but they forget uh, um, one aspect, and that's very important, uh, and that's the fact that these women uh, are in indoctrinated since birth, since childhood, into the notion of religious mod uh, modesty or uh, uh, the um uh, uh, the modest culture. So, um, and the result uh, in our societies, in our communities, and conversation is that uh, we find all these women. And I'm, 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 I mean, I can almost. I don't know. I don't want to overgeneralize, but we all came across women uh, who are Muslims or who are wearing their hijab, and who would ask us, for instance, when are you gonna wear your hijab? Or uh, who would who come up very critical if we remove hijab, or of, uh, or, or, or if we refuse to uh, to wear it. Where all this is coming from? Well, it's coming from the indoctrination, the uh, indirect indoctrination into these uh, notions of um, uh, modesty and uh, legitimacy of the men to control and police women's uh, uh, bodies uh, using the religious uh, teaching, of course, and uh, along uh, with the political hegemonic uh, ideologies. And I think this is where Noel Sadawi comes up uh, 
as a true leader and uh, a true leader of a change and uh, um, uh, enlightenment and um, in a more um, uh, explicit this uh, discourse in more explicit narratives Noel uh, declares that religions in general are the main ordeal and the source of oppression for women and, and that's inevitable and undeniable and I think uh, uh, here where uh, Noel Sarawi becomes uh, uh, the dangerous writer and, and thinker as she likes to call herself and as many of her followers and fans like to uh, to call her um, and actually this is the most part that influ influenced me most personally and that that the um the uh, the willing to take to take the risk in talking about uh women's oppression so um uh, uh, this is an area where her uh, radical feminism uh, comes into full shape, uh, in my opinion, and where it, the, her radical feminism is well um, uh, catalyzed. Uh, I mean, we know that the, the backlash against uh, feminism is everywhere in the world, uh, and that's not limited to uh, uh, the Muslim-majority countries or Arab, um, and that the load of uh, patriarchy sits on the shoulders almost of every single woman and every society um, but we cannot deny and this is what I found her really um, a dangerous thinker and writer and pretty straightforward and honest we cannot deny uh, that this is uh, is boosted up is reaffirmed and it's enabled uh, by uh, the uh, by religions and particularly uh, by Islam in my in uh, Muslim majority countries so um, and Noel's views uh, that the uh, sexist, misogynist uh, cultural practices against uh, women uh, are undeniably reinforced by, by religions. Um, and I mean, uh, even though we don't want to reduce her to the discourse around or the narratives around FGM, but because this is uh, unfortunately an ongoing practice in many countries around the world, I think it, um, her contribution here remains relevant all the time and remains worth mentioning and revisiting uh, um, again and again. Uh, why is that? I mean, um, based on my understanding because i mean the this pro, the narrative of fgm comes in almost uh, every single uh, fundamentalist speech uh, or uh, discourse uh, every single speech or discourse of all these religious clergy and uh, uh, figures and uh, uh, religious zealots and um, so um, these types of, of of struggles and battles and, and, and nawal's advocacy to uh, feminist the, to the feminist social um, justice uh, defines uh, again what what's called radical feminism in in her work um uh, so uh, the uh, her opposition to the uh, political and the social uh, institutions agenda and ideologies in Egypt or in and the rest of the Arabic speaking um, and nations um, in general um, is um, uh, where uh, women are not accustomed to to the habit of not having a voice or forming an opinion uh, but they're not they even deprive it of like raising that voice and uh, uh, or speaking openly about the, the opinions they 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 form um, and uh, uh, and challenging uh, the cultural and religious uh, and, and norms, I think Nawal Sarami, um, all these battles, through all these battles, she um, undermines uh, patriarchy and whatever comes along patriarchy, uh, the hierarchical uh, structure, um, such as class, uh, which um, is an area that she uh, tackled so um, uh, deeply and uh, um, she wrote about it and uh, 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 and many of her of her articles and writings and and plays, um, I uh, have not read much of Nawal Sadawi, even though I'm so inspired by her writing and her style, and of course her radical feminist, particularly the notion of radical feminism and how she understands uh, that. I mean, I remember in one of her uh, interviews when she was asked what the, what does she mean by uh, uh, or why the, does she want to be identified as a radical feminist, and she said, "Well, there are different types of feminists, which is true. There are different." 
types of feminist discourses around the world, but in Arabic speaking world, in the Arab speaking nation, uh, nations, I mean, we need to fight for all these feminism, all these forms of feminism, feminism because uh, they're all um, in, uh, there is a lack of all these types of, of um, uh, feminism. So like I said, I haven't read all of her uh, books, but I read so much of her articles uh, and I read um, uh, one of the books that is uh, uh, that uh, clung to, to me and uh, um, spoke to me personally as a, a nascent, if I may introduce myself, a nascent Tunisian feminist, uh, uh, is her uh, woman at point zero. Uh, and uh, uh, where I think uh, Nawal Sadawi provided a, a clear and pretty neat approach uh, on how she understands patriarchy as an expression of um, socioeconomic uh, oppression and where she insisted that the status of uh, women uh, should be accompanied by the defeat of capitalism uh, alongside, I mean, uh, patriarchy, if we really have a good intention, if we really have an honest intention to improve and establish, um, uh, uh, to improve the women's status and establish um, an equal um, system. So the character in the book, in uh, uh, a woman at point zero, her name uh, was uh, Ferdows. Uh, and uh, I mean, the way it was introduced in the book, from what I remember, is that she was she met the author in in a prison, on where the author gave her a floor to um, share her her narratives, to uh, voice out her her story um, without interruption, and that's very important. Not interrupting women when, when they are uh, voicing out there, because we don't we, women don't do this and don't get these these uh, chances all the time. Uh, so. Uh, Fardos was married to, uh, uh, first of all, she underran, like many women, the, uh, she went through FGM practice. That's what first oppression she faced. It. Uh, but then she was forced into this marriage with uh, an older guy, an older man uh, than her, who treated her very poorly, very badly. And then uh, she had to uh, run away and... Um, jump into the uh, world of uh, prostitution, uh, selling uh, her body. But what I found very interesting about this character is that um, uh, she was uh, the, uh, she was presented as a woman uh, who had a great ability uh, in manipulating the uh, the forces which uh, are more powerful than her, and that's by taking uh, prostitution as um, a tool of rebel or, or an instrument of a liberation of a freedom. So for those uh, the main character of this book, she insisted on uh, a high price for her body. Uh, she uh, rejected men uh, who were dirty and above all she resisted by making her body uh, passive during the sexual intercourse and that makes me question all the time what are the different methods that women in uh, in North Africa or in, in in the Middle East? What are all women, even in those uh, uh, in, in whatever society and where they find themselves oppressed? What are the different methods and how, methods and how could we legitimize those methods if they turn into tools or instruments of uh, liberation? I mean, here uh, the resistance in a sexual intercourse. But uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about the use of drama. I mean, always there's this stereotype that women always use drama but i mean yeah why not if, if that's a, if that's if that's a method if that's a tool it's gonna lead me to win over the patriarchal dominance so why not and this point specifically uh, i mean speaks to me um and my resistance are coming from the, the same of course the same society as noel Sarawi. i mean it's not too much different uh, so uh, this is um, uh, this is what I find really interesting. And another scene, if I remember, is the scene of a food where uh, for those uh, what, what for? Um, um, I think in the house. Yes. I'm sorry. I will not interrupt. I, I am I am uh, waiting to find myself at a good point to interrupt you, and I can't find it. Okay, no so, problem. <laughs> so, but we have 15 minutes left in the program, and I thank you very much. As I said again, every. Uh, this is a topic that uh, that needs a lot of uh, a lot of time, and uh, I hope that we can have more uh, more of these uh, broadcasts that we can uh, speak about them. So thank you very much for your input.
Um, and we will, uh, I want to bring on Amr Zahar to speak, uh, and then we'll bring everyone uh, in to uh, have an open dialogue for whatever uh, time left in the program. Amr, thank you for joining me. Hi, Wissam Kifa. Amr, you wrote on Arab Mother's Day, we lose the Arab mother to us all. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace, Nawal Saadawi, Allah Yerhamik. You got, uh, you got about 2,000 comments. Uh, uh, there is a uh, 1.1, I mean, a thousand and a hundred likes. You got uh, 213 love. You got 83 caring. You got 66 oh. angry. Oh, that's it. 16 okay. shot. Oh. And 414 left. Oh, while okay. 393 cried. So about 75 okay. percent of your audience actually in agreement with you. Uh, but you had interesting comments, and uh, if you, your audience is very wide, and uh, uh, Amr Zahir is a, a professor of law at the Detroit Mercy and, uh, and a community activist, a Palestinian rights activist, and a comedian, uh, one of the uh, Arab American uh, voices um, in, the, in, in America. I consider him one of the most important voices. Uh, and you have a wide audience, very representative of Arab American community in, in the United States, because everyone likes comedy and everyone likes you. Uh, no. So your the comments on your posts are very telling. Uh, and Zainab uh, Asaf, she spoke about that, uh, about uh, sometimes the conversation is really a lot lower than what Nawal Sadawi was about. Uh, what What's your take on that? Yeah, well, again, thanks, Wissam, for putting this together, and thanks for having me with the wonderful panelists that you've had so far, which uh, I don't measure up to. But um, I uh, look, you know, I, the unfortunately, well, look, social media always fosters a conversation that is not, uh, well, let's just say a bit more superficial than we would than we would like. That's number one. Um, but number two, you know, what I saw was a, an oversimplification of of uh, Nawala Saadawi and her views. And, you know, oversimplifications are not, um, you know, an oversimplification can be, um, you know, oversimplified but accurate, you know, but in this case, they were oversimplified but and inaccurate, you know. It's, it's easy to oversimplify her. You know, you have to read her work to understand uh, that she was coming from a position of love, for the Arab culture, a position of love and someone who wants to see the Arab culture and the Arab world in a better place. And that's why when I saw people reducing her to uh, an Islamophobe or an atheist or, you know, not that atheist is, is generally necessarily bad or anything, but she actually rejected those terms. I mean, we have quotes from Noel Sadawi and she didn't like labels you know, generally, like most intellectuals don't. Um, and when she was asked if she was an atheist, she said, you know, in order to be an atheist, you have to refuse religion. And she said, I'm not an atheist because I'm outside of religion. I don't believe in it or not believe in it, but I see it as a social phenomenon, okay? And she studies it in that way, uh, just like any other ideology. Now, you might not like that, but that's not the mark of an atheist, right? An atheist is someone who very loudly and proudly says, there is no God. Noel Sadawi was not that simple, you know, and it wasn't that simple. You know, I go back to the to the uh, quote that uh, Barbara Nimri Aziz brought up, that story where a reporter asks her, are you a good Muslim? And she says, that's between God and me. First of all, that's not something an atheist says normally, okay? And it's not something an Islamophobe says. You know, you have to understand Noel Sadawi as, as, an, as a native, you know, the same words can mean different things coming from different people. So, if if uh, if an Arab if, if if an Arab commits a horrific act, you know, something that the media might call terrorism, although I hate that word, but if an Arab commits a horrific act and 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 people are watching the news, and if there's a white guy from uh, you know the middle of nowhere America watching that, and he says, "I hate Arabs." And if we, Sam, you're sitting and watching it with all your Arab friends and you watch that and you say, 
I hate Arabs. Those mean two totally different things, right? And we all understand that those mean two totally different things because you're coming, coming from uh, different contexts and experiences and different motives. And Noel Sadawi was coming from, from that place in the latter example as someone who's a native of this culture who says, I want to see things be better. See, Islamophobes don't want the Muslim world to advance, right? They want the Muslim world to disappear, to disintegrate. Noel Sadawi is not an Islamophobe. Yes, she 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 uh, uh, is a rejects political Islam. Yes, she sees the hijab as a tool of patriarchy. Yes, she wrote about these things deeply. Yes, she said very controversial things about the uh, the Quran and the and the holy texts. But you can't simply classify her as an Islamophobe, like many Muslims are doing. That this is the sort of reductionist thinking that. Um, for lack of a better term, Western or American and European commenters engage in. We have to be very careful not to do that so as not to lose the real uh, uh, essence of who she was. For instance, on the hijab, and then I'll end here. For instance, on the hijab, she says, you know, I, okay, so she's against the wearing of the hijab. She sees it as a tool of patriarchy. Okay, <clears throat> so she got to that conclusion. If you ask Noel Sadawi how she gets to that conclusion, it's pretty simple. She says, well, I read, the, I read and studied Islam and the Quran very carefully. I read the Quran. The Quran tells, doesn't say to me, it uses specific language about other things like covering your breasts, and, but it doesn't say cover your hair. So specifically to me, there is no Quranic uh, 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 requirement to cover your hair, although that could have been a Quranic, a Quranic requirement, but it wasn't. So since that requirement doesn't exist, and since the... Um, a phenomenon of veiling does exist, then she finds a different reason as to why it exists. So she looks at patriarchy and tools of oppression and other things. Now, you can disagree with her as to why it exists, but that's not the way an Islamophobe would operate. In fact, an Islamophobe says, Islam and the Quran require veiling. That's the first thing an Islamophobe says, okay? Because they don't understand, they don't read Arabic, they've never read the Quran. So they say, uh, uh, the Quran requires veiling, and that's a symbol of the oppression of women, something inherent in Islam. No, Noelle Sadawi said something different. She says, she, she says very clearly, the, the uh, uh, oppression of women is not something that we must see as inherent in Islam. It's something that Islam as a civilization and maybe Arabs as a civilization have done and engaged in because patriarchy predates all this stuff, but not that it's inherently in the culture. That would inherently in the culture is the way an Orientalist or an Islamophobe would talk. And Noel Sadawi didn't talk like that. And so we have to be very clear about how we frame her when we're having these discussions after her death. And so, yes, as someone who's not that religious, and maybe now Ali Sadawi didn't believe in God, I don't know. But yes, I do say Allah Yirhama because she, she was a major figure, a giant, not just for women, but for all Arabs in the last century. Thank you, Amr. Thank you. Stay with us, please. I'm going to bring everyone in. Thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, participation. Uh, I have a few questions for you before we leave. Uh, but if anyone has comments on what uh, Amr has said, uh, uh, please go ahead before I ask my question. Jinan, do you have something? Any comments? You're muted. No, I really loved what Ahmed said. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the question is, do you, do you, are you going to find, I'm going to ask Jinan since uh, the same order as we started. Uh, are you, uh, do, do you find that what uh, uh, Nawal Sadawi has, has fought for is going to become relevant at a futuristic time? Uh, do you feel that she has the audience that she has been addressing. Uh, is that audience has been, has been improving or is it something that's gonna come up in the future? That's a really good question, um, Wissam, and I'm glad you asked it. And I think that the nature of work, when you are a committed intellectual and activist, and as Amr said, when you are really committed to improving your community and loving your community, that I think you, you do the work, it's like being a parent a little bit, and you don't know how your work is going to impact people in the future, but you kind of are driven by a passion for justice and a kind of empathy for your community. So I think that, you know, I think that that was driving her, 
my own assessment is she will become increasingly important. Because I think if you think a little bit about how she talks about the intersection of how religion is used to prop up capitalism and patriarchy, in a sense, Noel Saadewi was, avant la lettre, as they say, an intersectional feminist before that became. And as we look, for example, at what happened with the attack on the Asian women, as people are beginning to understand how the fetishization and the sexualization, for instance, of Asian women intersects with economics, that these are women who are doing sex work and they are very often exploited workers and that they are very often the, the um, the result of our imperialist wars that I think that the kind of analysis and the insistence on looking at things in very specific ways intersectionally, but within a global context, as Noelle Saadewi never tired of reminding us, I think it's going to make her work increasingly important. And I, as, and as I said in my little um, introduction, is that her recognition of anger. I already see younger Egyptian feminists, for example, there's a very interesting phenomena now of women writing anonymously on blogs about the kind of sexual harassment that they are experiencing. And there's a kind of freedom in expressing the rage. So I think in reclaiming for women emotions as anger, my prediction is that her work will become increasingly important. Thank you. Uh, definitely, there is uh, a movement uh, uh, of uh, more outspoken uh, feminists in the in, in, in the in the Middle East and the, the Arab world. Um, Nawal Sadawi, uh, she uh, took stances against uh, social injustice and political injustice, uh, at, at and she opened many different fronts in front of her. Um, does that in, in your meeting with her, Barbara, in New York, uh, we have some uh, also instances where she was giving lectures in various universities in the United States, and she would criticize uh, uh, some of the uh, actions of the uh, American uh, government, or uh, she would even fight for feminism uh, within the United States. She didn't consider that. Uh, necessarily women were at the at their best position at uh, in the, in the west uh, have you encountered personally with her that that thought process you're muted yeah thank you well absolutely i mean i mean uh, her statements are so widely publicly available and her writing uh, what i found difficult was how she was almost ostracized by, again, we're going back to the 90s and even the early 2000s, for a long time ostracized by her own people here, uh, Arab uh, communities who needed a heroine, who needed uh, good spokespeople, who needed daring um, a people uh, willing to handle the American Western media. And uh, I feel badly that uh, she was outside of most of our community. Um, and she was championed, on the other hand, by the Western feminists who she criticized. So it was a very difficult role for a leader to play. And I do hope, uh, that, as Janan suggests, that, and, and the others, that she will be examined more carefully, especially since she has given us so many books. Uh, she'll be examined and, and thought about more extensively by all Arab women, whether we're here or we're, we're living in the homelands. That's all I'll say right now. I mean, there's you've opened up a dialogue with Sam, and thanks very much for that. Uh, we could go on for much longer, I know. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Zainab, uh, Zainab, yeah, Zainab is with us. Uh, Zainab, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Issam. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't see you, but at least we can hear you. Uh, yeah. Zainab, I, I have, uh, so I'm worried about something. Um, the, some of them, uh, 
Arab feminists and you, you know in the Asr al Nahda in the in the Arab awakening in the Arab Renaissance in the in the early twentieth uh, century and late nineteenth century there were some outspoken uh, Arab women al um, al Fatat was Sheikh the book uh, the book that was written also about hijab at that time uh, things that are um, sometimes you think that's very advanced to be written in the 1920s. Um, I was hoping that these would have time where they would come back to life and would play more a role in our society, but we haven't seen that. We haven't seen the Renaissance writers like Qasim Amin and others. We haven't seen their literature come back to life. Do you think that... Uh, uh, that, that they will at, at, a, at a certain point and will Nawal Stada we end up forgotten like the also writers of the Renaissance in the future? You know what, Rissan, that's a very important question actually. And then when we say our culture, we have to ask ourselves what kind of culture we are teaching. I mean, how about if we teach instead of teaching all these um, very uh, specific shuyukh of Islam who were like very tight in their understanding. How about if we teach, for example, Ibn Arabi and Ibn Rush and all these people, like our whole perspective, our whole understanding will be really shifting to a completely different place. I mean, when we think about like, when we are studying European history, for example, it's mainly the Renaissance, it's mainly um, all these people who changed humanity. But what we did is we marginalized them in our culture. These people are not anywhere. You have to really go and look for them instead of like being in our schools, instead of teaching them. We teach the versions which are not they don't work, they don't work anymore. Like these are kind of like frozen in time and we are still there. So I, I feel like it's not only about feminism with some, the problem is much bigger than that. The problem is about what kind of ideas we are producing today. Um, are we at least are, are we at least at the level of the Abbasi time, for example, which is like people were talking about Khalq al-Quran, for example, you know, so the, the even nature of Quran. So these kind of questions, we cannot even think about asking them today in the 21st century. And that can tell us like even just the hijab is not something very principal in our Al Aqida and Sharia, and I think I, I think um, Nawal talked about this too. So it's not it's not something very principal. But now even talking about this, which is like a really the detail of the detail, became a taboo. We cannot even discuss it. Like once you open your mouth and you say that, and you know what? Even my own students they do attack me when I talk this way because like. No, this is something, they, they take it very personal. But listen, no, we're having discussion about like, this is something not very important. The discussion that were happening in the third history century are much more advanced than the discussions we're having today. And this is really sad, actually. I mean, I don't know, is it gonna change in the future? So that's why Nawal al-Sadawi is a very important figure. We still need a lot of Nawal al-Sa'da. We still need a lot of martyrs who are ready to be slaughtered all the time during their life and their death until we really get to this point, which is like we see ourselves in a mirror because it's very, it's very easy to keep attacking others. You know, like we are the victims. This is what others did to us. But once we start seeing ourselves in a mirror, this is when the whole narrative changed. And when I say that, I say that everyone, not only men or women, the whole culture, you know, because we know like today, like, and it's really sad. And a lot of people were talking about that, that women who are attacking Nawal al-Sadawi are much more than men. And I don't find, I'm not very surprised because women are the gatekeepers of the culture. So they feel like they have to defend their choices and they feel that Nawal is somehow an example that cannot 
it's it doesn't follow the stereotype and this is really hard for them they cannot accept it so i think yeah i i think we still have a long way to go we sound yeah thank you zainab yeah definitely we have a long way to go what a, a final question for you um the uh, you know uh, there is not a person more than Nawal Sadawi going all out, speaking her mind as it is. I don't think there's any reservations that she has kept. That she's remained fierce as her brand from first day to the last interview she, she had. Um, do you feel that this emboldens activists that, you know, okay, well, she died in, in Egypt and she you know, lived her life. She went through all these struggles and all these attacks and lawsuits. She she made her way through. She, I think, she came out victorious. Do you think this emboldens uh, and strengthens uh, freedom of speech and and activists? Well, quite. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I think that uh, the effect of all this is uh, quite the opposite. Uh, we need a shocking method as far as feminist grows and as far as taking the, rich, uh, the risk. And I think uh, uh, part of what made uh, Noel Sadawi unique is uh, uh, this honesty and straightforwardness in her discourse and narratives. And, and after all, I mean, she's, she, that's why she's called, I mean, a danger writer or a danger author. We need more danger uh, minds and danger authors and danger uh, feminists. And uh, like uh, uh, Munat Tahawi and Jinan uh, spoke about angry feminists who uh, who would use, yeah, who would not who would not um, uh, shy away from using the direct method and naming the spade the spade and facing the uh, the patriarchy and it's uh, and, uh, uh, the sources that reinforce patriarchy, whether religious or political, uh, um, direct. Uh, I think uh, what's lacking, actually, and the reason why we're lagging right, right now is because we're still shy as women or as feminists because of the of the cultural uh, oppression, the the political oppression put on us. But. Uh, 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 the more bold we come out, the more straightforward, the more the more we uh, use uh, Nawal Sadawi's approach, uh, the more I mean uh, we um, uh, tra transition uh, the feminist narrative uh, uh, as far as the uh, North uh, North Africa and the Middle East uh, is uh, concerned. Um, I, I think that. Um, uh, uh, part of the reasons, and I may be, may be wrong, but this is my reading. Part of the reasons why uh, women's status in Tunisia, for instance, in comparison to other uh, countries in the region, uh, it is slightly better, is because of these outspoken uh, and uh, bold uh, feminist uh, voices who, yes, they're undergo uh, under, uh, undergoing a lot of threats, they're facing uh, a lot of struggles, uh, uh, some of them even um, jailed, went to jail uh, and uh, but uh they created, they made the change. And nowadays, I mean, if you see the younger generations, the young feminists, I mean, they are on fire. And nowadays, because of the feminist and the intersectionalist approach that they understood, even though, like, I personally have some issues with intersectionalism, but because of this intersectionalist approach that was pioneered by Nawal Sadia, we, I mean, these young um, feminists, these young um, women, nowadays, for instance, in, in, in a nation like Tunisia, we don't only speak about uh, a class and the feminism has to have and women have to have rights we're speaking about rights of lgbtq and they're bold they're in the street lgbt people are in the street in tunisia we're speaking about the rights of the natives of the amazigh women and amazigh men and it's a bold discourse and it all comes out to how to this uh, um, direct and straightforward and the shocking method uh, that noel sada we used in her discourse and i think i mean uh, the the results are quite the opposite if you all come together outspokenly i think we're going to change a lot Thank you, Wafa. And with that, we come to an end uh, of our program. Unless someone wants okay. to say any final words before I end. Thank you very much. I uh, I want to thank my guests and everyone who watched this program. It will be available immediately after uh, the end of the show at uh, the YouTube and uh, Facebook uh, pages of Muslimish. And it will be available shortly on uh, Muslimish Freethinkers podcast and Dearborn blog podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, may uh, Nawal Sadawi rest in peace. And may 
all activists have her strength and her uh, fierce energy <coughs> to fight for human rights and for women's rights. Have a great uh, rest of your week. Thanks very much for organizing this. It was a very nice program. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jinan, and thank you, Afa, thank you, Zainab, and thank you, Amr Zahra, who had to go for another show. Thank you for listening to Muslimish Free Thinkers. Do let us know what you think of this episode at facebook.com forward slash muslimish. Don't forget to visit us at muslimish.org.